Hello and welcome to our weekly district online prayers. Uh, good to gather again today. I'm uh, recording this in fact because it's likely that I won't quite be available around half past six this evening. So it's uh, Thursday morning the 11th of April uh, when I'm recording this uh, but glad for those who are joining at the usual time when we uh, do this at 6.30 on the Thursday but also glad for those who are joining at some other later time to catch up. You're very welcome indeed. I'm grateful as ever for uh, your commitment in joining together faithfully as we continue to pray for God's reviving spirit on our lives, our churches and in our world. So let's come together in prayer. Let's uh, just be still, seek that sense of uh, comfort in the Lord's presence uh, and alertness to his uh, voice in our midst, speaking through scripture, speaking uh, by his spirit, that we might know more of Jesus here as we gather in his name. We open with the prayer for today in our prayer handbook, which we'll just uh, reflect upon and use initially, and then some other prayers, and then looking at our scripture again, and then praying for our world. So let's be still. So these words from the 19th century. Pour into our hearts, O God, the love that casts out fear, the truth that sets us free, and the grace that is sufficient for all our needs. Though you are unseen, do not be unknown. Though you are hidden from our eyes, let us rejoice in your beauty at the last. Amen. As we allow those words to sit with us, to sit within us, then let's just be glad for the richness of what's offered here in reminding us of God's perfect love the truth that liberates, of the grace that truly is amazing and sufficient. That although God is immortal, invisible, still he is known to us. Though he's hidden from our eyes, we can rejoice in his beauty and trust in seeing that beauty fully displayed at the last. So I invite you to really uh, take on these words as your prayer, as I offer these words again now, that wherever you are, you might uh, ask that God meet deeply with you, freshly with you, vibrantly with you in these moments of quietness together. So this prayer again. Pour into our hearts, O God, the love that casts out fear, the truth that sets us free, and the grace that is sufficient for all our needs. Though you are unseen, do not be unknown. Though you are hidden from our eyes, let us rejoice in your beauty at the last. Loving God, we thank you that you are all good. Perfect love, amazing grace, truth, yes, that sets us free. As we gather now, we pray for your reviving spirit to be freshly, powerfully at work in our lives, our churches, our world, that you would, by your spirit, enable our prayers to truly be in the name of Jesus and to be valuable 
in your kingdom's economy. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And some prayers uh, using Lectio 365, wonderful app uh, that's downloadable for your phone that has prayers every day. And uh, there's a series at the moment looking at God's Spirit and uh, the theme of today has been Wind of the Spirit and just uh, some prayers here which I hope will feed our praying together from Lectio 365. Creator God, who formed humanity from dust, breathe in us again. Revive us and sanctify us by the power of your Spirit. Set our hearts on fire with the good news of your gospel. Set our hearts on fire with the good news of your gospel. And the passage uh, that is the focus of the prayers today on that app uh, we'll just look at now. It's uh, from Ezekiel and it's chapter 13. It'll be a passage that is familiar to many of us, I guess. Um, the prophet Ezekiel gets caught up in a vision. He's transport transported to a valley full of dry bones. God asks a provocative question. Can these bones live? What a what a great question to ask as we look at, well, all sorts of things, uh, not least our church perhaps sometimes. Ezekiel is unsure, but at God's invitation, prophesies over the dry bones. And then we read this. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. As the commentator continues, as in Genesis, we see a correlation between God's wind and God's word. Ezekiel prophesies and speaks the word of God and then the word of God comes and animates that which is dead, bringing it back to life. And so the invitation, just as we continue to be praying, perhaps primarily just holding ourselves at the moment before God, but certainly our churches and our world too, take a moment and just look over the valley of your own life. Are there elements of it at least that are all bits and pieces to some of your heart, your life, your church's heart, your church's life, your dead and disassembled? God, what do you want me to speak over my own life, over our church, into the world? We listen now to hear what you might say to us. God, what do you want me to know? And a prayer for ourselves. God, I believe you will put me back together. I prophesy to the breath, Holy Spirit, wind of God. You will bring life into what feels dead. These bones shall live. Amen. And then a prayer. For our church, God's church, God, I speak life over your beloved church in the world. Where it is dismembered, bring it back together. 
where it looks dry and dead, animate it with your word and your spirit. These bones shall live. I just wonder as I pray how you feel as you've heard those words and as I've invited you to make those words your own. How faith-filled your expressing of those words has been able to be. How trusting in God's loving power and knowing what is most needful how that has brought effect to your prayers. I just invite you as I read these prayers, these two prayers for ourselves and for our church, just to seek to ask God to make you feel full of conviction as you pray. God, I believe you will put me back together. I prophesy to the breath, Holy Spirit, wind of God, you will bring into life what feels dead. These bones shall live. Amen. God, I speak life over your beloved church in the world. Where it is dismembered, bring it back together. Where it looks dry and dead, animate it with your word and your spirit. These bones shall live. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing in those prayers uh, with me. We're going to turn to Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. We began looking at that great book last week and we looked at uh, the first five verses of chapter one. We're going to look now at verses six to eleven. Six to eleven, the ascension of Jesus. We've not quite arrived there yet in the church calendar. It's really hard to fully liaise and coordinate in that way but nonetheless we just steadily take our way through this book now and it's a great book it's going to take us quite some time but what a journey it's going to be as we share together in the book of the acts of the apostles and the account of the early church as it is filled with the spirit as it comes to life as it seeks to come to terms with what god is inviting it to be and how he's inviting it to be shaped so from verse 6 to 11 of chapter 1. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, uh, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Man of, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, I wonder how you respond when, whenever you hear this account of the ascension. I think we need to, as with all scripture, we need to handle it carefully. Uh, the danger is we're left with entirely the wrong impression about what was happening. Um, let me just say uh, just a few things briefly about it. Uh, first of all, um, we see in this account of Jesus's ascension, God's unconditional commitment to all of the world, to us and to all the world. Uh, the danger is we look at this account and we can think of it rather a bit like you know, on Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty. God, uh, withdrawing Jesus from planet Earth um, to be safe at God's right hand. But that's not actually what's happening here. Uh, this is about God's unconditional commitment to the world being 
uh, laid bare all over again. Um, we have in verse 6 the disciples hoping, hoping now, as they did back in Luke 17, that the kingdom of God would truly come now. Why? Primarily, I guess, to overthrow the Romans. But Jesus continues to give the same answer that he gave back in Luke 17. It's a, it's, and it's not just a not just yet answer. He tells them in verse 8 that the Holy Spirit will come and give them power and enable their witness, starting with those who already know God in Jerusalem, and spreading out to those who don't, even to the ends of the earth. So Jesus' withdrawal as a post-resurrection form isn't about a withdrawal from the world. It's a precursor to Jesus' followers, you and me, having power to witness to all the world, no longer bound in Palestine. The ascension demonstrating God's unconditional commitment to the world. Secondly, the ascension demonstrating Jesus' eternal presence with us, always with us. Far from Jesus withdrawing from the out action, the promise is that Jesus loses the restraints of time and place and by his spirit is now with us and all followers in every time and place, everywhere. No inch without the promise of the presence of Jesus. So what is happening is not Jesus' withdrawal from us, but he's drawing ever close to us. In verse 9, we heard Luke talking of a cloud hiding Jesus from their sight. And in the Bible, of course, the cloud represents the intimate holy presence of God. The cloud leads the children of Israel out of captivity. It's over the mountain when Moses receives the Ten Commandments. In the account of the transfiguration on the mountain, the cloud covers Jesus and the three disciples. So when in the ascension the cloud is mentioned by Luke, it represents Jesus being gathered into the eternal presence of God, the earthly Jesus, now fully, eternally, comprehensively again within the wholeness of God and Jesus, that Jesus, becoming available to all people at all times in all places. And then look in verse 10 when he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven suddenly two men in robes appear, two men dressed in white, white. Uh, when the disciples were looking in the tomb there were two men dressed in white why do you look for the living among the dead? So don't look for Jesus among the dead or in the sky. No, don't look for him in the dead or in the sky. Look for him in the midst of life here on earth. I think that's really powerful for us. And don't look in the dead. Don't look into the sky. Look for him in life here in the earth, here on the earth. And, and thirdly, the ascension calls us to pray with the promise of the power to witness, to pray. As we were praying, as we were using those verses from Ezekiel, that dry bones might be knit together again and receive fresh life. So this is a passage about prayer. Verse 12, we'll read on. Next week, the disciples return to Jerusalem to pray. So this is a call to pray and to do so knowing that we come to the God who has that desire for us to receive his power and to witness in his world. The Jesus who is close to us at the heart of life, he is with us and for us. We pray, we pray for Jesus to fill us by his spirit with all that he is so that we can play our part in seeing the kingdom of God come with great power but in truth and with grace and full of the love of God. Thanks be to God for this wonderful passage. So let's spend a few moments now praying. Lord we thank you that you're the God who doesn't withdraw but the God who constantly comes close.
You're the God who enables us to know Jesus with us as Emmanuel. And so we're praying, as those disciples were commanded to do, we're praying for more of your spirit to be poured out amongst us so that we can see more fully Jesus in the midst of life here on earth. And so as we continue to pray for ourselves, so we continue to pray for our churches. We invite you, as so often we do, just to call into your mind's eye your local church. Where is your spiritual home? Maybe it's the building that you first think of. Maybe it's some people who are part of a precious group or the congregation gathered in worship. We invite you to pray for your church that God's Spirit might come with fresh energy and life and fill your church. Forgive us, Lord, if our church life ever forgets you. And that's too, too easy. Help us always to be seeking more of you. Help us to be looking in the midst of life for your activity. Not just gazing up to heaven, but waiting upon you and looking for you and expecting you. So we give thanks for our churches, our solidarity and sharing together within circuits, within our district, ecumenically, all those who are partners with us in the gospel. We pray for the church nationwide, that we might have a fresh energy and desire to know what it is to be a faithful church in this 21st century. We pray for the church around the world, especially for those people in churches that are persecuted and downtrodden because of their faith. Lord, we pray that you would keep them safe and enable them to shine brightly despite all the efforts of those who oppose them to extinguish the light of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. And then let's pray for our world. Continue to pray for all those places that are war-torn and where the worry of increasing violence and war is intense. Oh God, we continue to pray for Israel and Gaza and for all who uh, are caught up in that, and especially for those who innocently are victims of the horrors of war. We pray for Ukraine and Russia and all that continues to spill out from there. We pray for the Red Sea and all the tensions there, for other places where there is civil unrest and civil war and where there is huge tension still. We look to you and we pray, Prince of Peace, come and bring your peace, even though in so many of these places it looks and feels so far away. Lord, we know you are the miracle maker, the way maker, and we pray for a miracle of peace, that you would raise up those who get the ear of others and who build fresh alliances and new ways forward, that there may be not just the laying down of arms, but the, the development and creation and imagination of, of a deep peace, shalom. And we continue to pray for all our parts of our world 
where climate change is having such an impact, where lives are being threatened and livelihoods lost through famine and flood and everything in between. Lord, we pray for all who have agency in enabling climate change to be challenged in changing behaviour. That includes us, of course. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray too for our local communities and our land, for those in leadership amongst us, for our government, for local government, for those seeking election in these days and campaigning. Give them purity of heart, we pray. Priority for the least and the lowest. A compassion that shapes not just political dialogue, but decision-making. And I invite you just to call to mind now any known to you who are particularly struggling at the moment, those in your community, those close to you. Hold them before God. And pray that Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, would be known deeply by them, perhaps through us or through other angels, or by God's extraordinary reach and love and goodness. So we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a verse of scripture and a closing prayer as we come to the end now. From Romans 15, we read, May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. Loving Father, help us to live these days to the full being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much again for being here and part of this prayer gathering. It's so precious and I value it tremendously and I'm so grateful. And I look forward to being with you next week. Thank you again. Good night. God bless. <laughs>